Thank you so much, Jim. I want to say that working in the design lab was such a transformational thing for me. It did teach me that you could take psychology into these kinds of realms, that tech wasn't just a place for, um, you know, just the people who uh, worked on computers. Um, although nowadays I do work on computers all day long, so see where that attitude took me. Um, I'm going to be talking about a project on young children learning a new language, which is a very tough thing to do, and yet all of these excellent young children do it all the time. Um, and it's a longitudinal exploration um, of a digital curriculum in China. And so you'll learn a lot more about that and the setting of that. But I also need to meta introduce the structure of this. And I think this is very apropos of who I am and how I work, that this is a collaborative talk. So I have other speakers to introduce here who I'm really excited for you to get to know. And one is Dr. Heejin Bain, who is the director of efficacy research for a company called Age of Learning. And the other is Dr. JC Chen who is uh, the curriculum specialist on this project and many other very cool projects translating these curricula. So they'll be taking over different, you'll kind of see how our different perspectives fit into this talk um, because this is a collaboration. So my company is Catharsis Consulting and we are an applied social science consultancy. I use about five or six different labels for what it is that we do depending on who we're trying to pitch to. So don't get too caught up in that. Um, but what I try to focus on what I really consider my mission is not just doing rigorous work on data and applying, you know, kind of cutting edge rigorous, rigorous data science techniques, um, but also the design of research. So really what happens before you even get that data and what it is in that design that changes everything about your interpretation of that data. So that's kind of our meta mission there. A lot of people come saying, I need someone who can crunch the numbers. And I say, I love the numbers. I really do like that stuff a lot. Um, but let's understand the problem. And I think that fits very well in the design lab. And Age of Learning is an example of an amazing problem space. So Age of Learning, if you haven't heard about it, um, some five-year-old in your vicinity has probably heard about it. They're a leading provider of digital learning experiences um, for children, primarily through apps. They're in many, many classrooms. I'll let the, our, our experts tell you more about that. But their mission is to help children build a strong foundation for academic success. So I was really excited when they came to me, and I just want to, you know, help kind of prime the talk by saying why, why is this a collaboration? You know, I could have brought a lot of projects to you. I think this one is a very cool case study of what applied research can look like. Um, one thing that struck me about it as soon as Heejin and I were talking about it is it's a non-weird population, at least in some respects. Um, there's a big conversation that's been happening for a really embarrassingly long time time in developmental psychology and other places about populations that are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, and that that's where a lot of our sort of laboratory research, a lot of the research on learning takes place. We have people in the audience um, right now, you know, who expand that sample, so I'm not saying that we're the only people, but it is a very exciting thing when, to me when a project comes across my desk like that. And I think you'll see that it's really inherently multidisciplinary. So I just want you to maybe keep that thought in mind about um, all of the pieces that need to come together for this kind of work. So we have curriculum design, product development, the efficacy research, and all of that trying to build on and understand the principles of learning science. So the, maybe the really simple point I have to make is just, you know, when you can design together with all of these people, um, it's not just a nice to have, like, oh, how cool, you know, we, we added on at the end of this, we had a meeting with, you know, the learning scientists, and, and we had a meeting with these people, we actually needed to bring all these people in from the very beginning. It's really a necessity. So the outline of the talk is we'll tell you a little bit about what it is that this product that we're talking about, where all of this data comes from. Um, JC will tell us about the curriculum design, which is a very um, intense question that we can't even do justice to um, in the time we have, but we'll at least touch on how we build for learning here. We'll talk about assessing the learning that happens outside of the game itself. And then I will talk a little bit about how I think of um, dealing with the data that is inside of these games, how you can connect it to performance what does performance even mean in this context, which is a big question for these digital environments. And I'll turn it over to Heejin now. Thank you, Kat. So I wanted to start off by asking you a couple of questions. 
How many of you know a five and six-year-olds in your life? Great, a bunch of you. Uh, how many of them are learning a new language? Okay. And how much time do you think they need to spend in order to gain some basic level of that target language? You can just throw out answers. How much time do you think they need to spend? Two years. Any other guesses? One year. One year. OK, so I wanted to have everyone kind of think about those questions, because um, at Age of Learning, we built a program called ABC Mouse English Learning Academy. And by the end of a um, six-month period, we found that five- and six-year-olds improved their English language skills almost three times. And that was the question that we wanted to ask uh, ourselves. How effective can we be using this program and helping children learn English? Um, I will turn this over to JC, who will talk about our um, curriculum and what ABC Mouse English Learning Academy is. I, I had a quick question. Yes. Exactly. And so, uh, real loosely, like, as vocabulary or something, like, what, what would that mean? So, um, we started, we wanted to target students who were beginner learners. Uh -huh. So, we'll get into a lot more detail about that, um, but we wanted to start off by introducing the program first. And well, I guess I just don't know what threefold means without it starting. So, imagine beginner level. We recruited students who had no knowledge of English. Well, so three times zero is zero. Not mathematically speaking, but assuming that you started at a baseline of um, almost no knowledge, growing three times that. Okay. Okay. First, I can uh, talk a little bit, uh, give you a brief introduction about what is ABC Mouse English Learning Academy. So it is a uh, language learning, self-learning program for young children. So the learners actually uh, go through the learning path in a uh, self-guided journey. So we take the learning outside of the classroom, so no real human interactions. And we also uh, always uh, to uh, optimize it with uh, the most updated technology and the educational trends to make sure our program is a research-based, engaging, and innovative. And we also personalize it with uh, some adaptive features, so and also build some uh, assessment to measure the learning outcomes. So if you see these pictures, this is actually it's a, a screenshot of our program, and it's a playground. So you can see different areas of playground. So there are four major elements around the program. It's research-based, it's structure, structure lessons, and we have a thousand interactive and adaptive learning games. And also, they can users can also explore the different areas based on their um, experience. I can talk about each of these elements in the following slide. First, our program is uh, research-based. So we follow the natural approach of language acquisition. So we believe like uh, listening and speaking is a foundation of language learning. So we want them kids to learn as how they learn their first language as when they were baby. So they learn start from the listening, speaking, and then writing and writing. And also among, among sure, uh, instead of the root memory, we want them to be able to communicate with each other. So that's we build our curriculum from the commun communicative functions and start from communicative functions and build the language structures and then go to the vocabulary. And also we want learning to be meaningful and uh, authentic. So the learning, the things they learn actually the relevant to their life so they can use, they can see they're in uh, real life. And also we involve different skills like the listening, uh, speaking, reading, and the writing. And we believe learning is a process of creative construction. So the kids are going to learn by making mistakes. So they're going to build, um, they're going to learn uh, through this process. And we also want to make sure the learning is uh, motivational and enjoyable. Structure, the second piece is structure lesson pass. So as you see in these uh, pictures, each dot is our one uh, 
game or one activity. And these activities、uh, is carefully structured by lessons, and then lessons structured by level. So there are about、uh, 500 lessons across eight levels. The learner goes through. So after they finish one lesson, they are guided for to the next lesson. So this is very structured lesson. Uh, we also have a 12 plus adaptive、uh, game engine, which drives hundreds of、uh, learning activities. So each engine actually is built based on the particular、uh, learning objectives, like the vocabulary learning,、uh, comprehension, or speaking. I can talk about more about、uh, each type of activities in the later slides, but for these activities, they can adjust the difficulties. Based on the user's、uh, performance, and also we can see the different background, the different themed, and we can、uh, easily change some parameters、um, through the configured designs. So, besides structured lessons, we also have some free area for them to explore. So, kids can go to the library, can go to the uh, playground, uh, they can build their rooms or go to the zoo, so they can play. On their own, based on their interest, they can control what they learn.、Um, next, so I, ju I just give you a brief、uh, descriptions of what is the program about, and then I'm going to talk about how our curriculum is designed, how what as consider、uh, considerations when we design our curriculum. So basically, we have three major considerations. First, I want to say we are targeted like three to eight year old.、Uh, Eng learning English as a foreign language, which means like、uh, they learn English in a society where English is not a dominant language. So they do have very limited opportunity to use English outside the classroom. And also, we base on、uh, we also、uh, refer to the the development sequences when we are、uh, building our language learning.、Um, we go to we talk we think about what、uh, the right sequences based on the developmental、um, de development, cognitive and linguistic development. And we also have referred to a lot of international language proficiency standards, like CIFR,、um, GSE, ACFO,、uh, Cambridge. So we just refer to a lot of. I can talk about some challenges later. So how we gonna、uh, put all the standards together and come up with our own standards? We also refer some learning science theory. Um, during the curriculum design, for example, we are believing in the self-determination theory. So, which means like the kids need to be motivated to learn. So, the thing they learning need to be. I think they they have the need to feel the close and the relationship with what they learn. They also need to feel they can control what they learn, and they want to be feel、um, competent, not feel frustrated during learning. So, in line with these three elements, actually. So we have this ABC Mouse character is a very child-friendly character, and also on some of the game we build is very familiar to the kids. Like this game we call is Wood Typer, which is、uh, based on the Wacom game. So like you using the hammer to hit on the different objects coming in and out from the hole. And as I said, they have the My Room area, so they can spend the learning tickets they earn. And decide how they can decorate their room, what they want to buy. So they all their own choice, and they can adjust the level based on their difficulty. If they feel too hard or too easy, they can adjust it. And also, even though within the game,、uh, it adaptively we have the adaptive features. They can adjust the difficulty、um, by the, the user's performance. Also, we our curriculum is we call it a PPPR model. So we first present something like vocabulary or target languages、uh, in a contest through like kids like、uh, live action video or animations or music or flashcard, and followed by practice, which they play some games、um, to help them to practice what they learn. Like for example, this game, the vocabulary game, they hear the word fish and they pop all the fish bubbles, ignoring the detractors. There are some listening comprehension games. And we also want to make sure they are able to produce what they learn. So we build some games actually help them to produce a language. For example, the girl in the door asks questions about, "Oh, what is the boy doing?" And the users needs to respond by recording their voice. So the, the boy is singing, and their responses actually being recorded by、uh, speech recognition technology and give the score. So they have the feedbacks to know how they、uh, respond.、And、they also have some、uh, conversation games where you hear conversation and then you choose the answer based on what you hear. 
And the last piece is the renew. So all the things you learn, like in the part A, B, C, and then we're going to review based on space reputations. We're going to bring them back uh, to review and also um, evaluate through some assessment. So last piece, I want to talk about some challenges during uh, curriculum design. As you know, we have three pieces of challenges I can think about it. First is we don't, our, since our target is a three to eight year old, very young children who learn English in, uh, as uh, foreign languages and they are fully digital learning program, uh, no human interventions. It's very hard to find some research to back up. We have like, there are not many literatures we can find to support that. And also I talk about international uh, language learning standards. All the standards we can find, like CIFR, uh, it's, it's, most, uh, it's very common to use for uh, EFF, EF our learners, but it's targeted more on the adult learner or the older learners. We have to really uh, remove some pieces not relevant to the children. And also some standards is a little bit vague. It's like, oh, the, ch the learners need to be familiar with the objects in their for, in everyday life. So we have to really consider what object, what the vocabulary we're going to teach, what uh, did it mean, f do they mean by f uh, familiar um, everyday life. And also that's why we have to consider a lot of uh, researchers and also because our study, our program is focused on um, the Chinese marketing, we also need to consider some, uh, China, some national English uh, curriculum standard in China because parents want to know like how your program, what, you, what uh, if I learn your program, what are gonna go compare to the Chinese uh, standards. And also we have the second piece is ongoing iterations. We have a lot of the iterations um, since we have the regular user testing in our company for the other products, but it's very hard to find a subject here like who doesn't know English, the kids doesn't know English at all. So it's very hard to find a, to do the user testing. So initially, actually all the feedbacks we hear is from the internal employee. Someone maybe have three year old says, oh, my daughter thinks it's too hard, you're gonna change it. And it's something is too easy. So we have a lot of ongoing uh, iterations, but now think, after we have the data, we can look at the data to see, oh, based on the performance, maybe this word is too easy for everyone. We may be considered to re remove it for the later iterations. Um, we also have a lot of compromise between curriculum products because from language learning, language, language learning perspective, we don't want them to be uh, language to be translated. We want them to learn in a real life, like learn how you learn your first language. But we also want to make to be sure, uh, make sure it's uh, engaging. The kids are going to love it. So they want to use some jokes, but the jokes is very incomprehensible if they make it in a second language. So they have to use some first language, like something like. And last piece at the culture and the marketing. So for example, we, we have to, uh, in our video, we need to consider a lot of gestures we're gonna use and even different cultures. And also for images, I got an example, we teach the word like dumpling, but our, the people helping us to find the images, actually finding the picture of this picture of a dumpling, but this is not a way call in China. So in China, we only call these things dumpling. So we call this like ball or something else. So we have to tell them, no, no, this is not dumpling we are, we are using. We have to use other things. So a lot of this is a lot of a challenges um, we incur during the curriculum design. Uh, then so we can talk about advocacy study, the how our res the results on the curriculum. I'm going to hand it to Hayden. Thank you, Jason. Okay. Um, we conducted a six-month efficacy study. And um, before I start talking about the study itself, I wanted to give some context for this study. As you know, in recent years, there's been a significant increase in the number of games uh, that has been designed to facilitate learning in a variety of subject areas. And research shows that language learning is especially well suited for um, digital game-based learning because of the immersive environment that it affords, as well as um, the possibility of lowering anxiety. And also, um, it allows for increased Usage of, usage of the target language in interactions. But relatively little research has been done on the effectiveness of these games and studies focusing on um, young children using these games to learn a foreign language is especially scarce. So there was one major question guiding our study. 
To what degree can a self-guided digital English language learning program help improve the English language skills of five and six-year-old Chinese children? And this is a study overview. It was a six-month study, as I mentioned earlier. It's, it was a randomized control design study, and it involved 122 children. 66 were randomly assigned to use our program, and 56 were asked to use a math application instead. To participate in the study, we recruited students, children who had a knowledge of less than 20 words in English. And we asked the treatment children to use our program for 15 to 20 minutes a day, six days a week, for the period of 26 weeks. And we collected a lot of data, as you can see here. Um, we administer language assessments, and those are the uh, results that I will focus on today. But we also administered uh, end of study surveys, as well as weekly surveys across the 26 weeks. And some of the parents participated in end of study interviews and uh, focus groups as well. OK, before I share the results itself, I also wanted to point out some interesting lessons that we learned um, given the context in which the study was conducted. So the first one is that six months is fairly a lengthy period of time for five and six-year-old children. So we anticipated some attrition actually substantial um, attrition. But we were actually very pleasantly surprised that we only experienced 93%, um, well, we experienced 93% retention rate. Um, the data of the children um, who um, we are not including in the analyses and um, uh, well, basically reasons for attrition were that um, they were had exposure to other English language programs uh, or were unable to make it to the assessment for one reason or another. Um, and uh, to participate in the study, one of the conditions was to not uh, have exposures to other English classes or programs similar to uh, ABC Mouse English Learning Academy. The other thing that we were surprised with was that the overall compliance with usage was very, very high. And um, you will recall that we asked the parents to complete a weekly survey. Uh, just to take one example, we had 100% participation rate across all 26 weeks for the parent surveys. And we actually have a joke going on in our company saying that we should do all of our studies in China. Um, <laughs> another thing that was interesting to us was that even though parents were very, very dedicated to the education of their children, they also had um, concerns about the length of exposure to screen. So we actually built in a timer in the app so that after 20 minutes of continuous use, the children will be forced to take a break. Um, another interesting point um, to make is that um, there were certain features that parents did not want their children to use, um, which in itself is understandable. But um, you'll recall that when JC was introducing the program, there was a section called My Room, where children, when they complete um, activities, they earn tickets. Um, it's kind of a reward, an incentive for them to continue using the program. And those tickets can be redeemed for things like pets or furniture for your room or clothing that you can change into. But because this was not strictly educational, parents did not want their children to use that. So basically taking away the reward or incentive system. Uh, and it led us to ask some interesting questions about what motivates five and six-year-olds in China to learn English and to use this program. Um, we don't have an answer to that question, but it is something that we are interested in exploring. Um, OK, so before the results, I would like to tell you a little bit more about the assessments that we used. Um, there was an external assessment and an internal assessment. The external one that's not aligned with our program, uh, the one that we used was the idea proficiency test. It's a test of oral English language proficiency designed for young children who, may, who have actually very little experience um, in testing situations. And the image that you see here is actually a cardboard. And uh, the examiner uses stick figures, cardboard figures, to ask questions. So for example, the examiner could point to a girl and say, her name is Sarah. What is your name? 
and then the child is expected to respond with his or her name. And we had 10 questions like this. Um, targeting vocabulary, some language functions, uh, reading comprehension, and grammar. In addition, uh, we had an internal assessment that was developed by our ELL curriculum specialists, English language learning curriculum specialists, as well as some assessment experts. And there were five sections, two focused on listening and three on speaking. Um, so you'll recall that, as JC was pointing out, we were really focusing on communicating, using language as a communication tool. Each section had five questions. Uh, the first one, vocabulary identification. Um, this is a sample question. The child heard an audio, in this case, son, and the task was to point to the picture, the correct picture that represents the audio. And the next section um, involved children listening to audio of one or two sentences. For example, I see ducks. One, two, three, three ducks. You'll also note that we had a, a distractor, in this case, an image of three pencils. So if the child understood the concept of three or recognized the word three um, and pointed that, that image instead of the duck, we wanted to give some partial credit. Um, and, of course, uh, with the question marks, they could point to that if they did not know the answer. The speech production uh, section involved the examiner asking, what do you see? Pointing to an image. And uh, um, the child was expected to produce an appropriate word representing that image. Um, and we also tried to give some partial credit. Conversation section involved the examiner asking a common question using the structures that were addressed in the, the program. So for example, what color do you like or do you like your shoes? Um, and the child had to produce an appropriate response to that question. The final section was pronunciation. Um, the target words in this section were pig, book, man, bed, and cookie. And they heard the audio of these words, and they had to reproduce that word. And we had a scoring system of good, fair, and poor um, that indicated whether they got all of the um, phonemes correct, or maybe were off by one, or it was incomprehensible. So I'm going to skip to uh, the overall assessment results now. Um, this is a graph representing the combination of the both external and internal assessment. Um, the lighter shades for each color, um, blue for control and orange for treatment, lighter shades represent the pre-test scores and the uh, darker shades represent the post-test scores and on the vertical axis you have the percent correct on the combination of those two scores, uh, two assessments rather. And we saw that on average um, children played the game for about 30 hours, and um, they experienced a threefold increase in their English language skills. Now, um, what I did for this particular graph was that um, I weighted the scores by the number of questions in each assessment, 10 in the external assessment and 25 in the internal assessment. But regardless of how I weighted, whether it's 50-50 or the sum of two assessments, 10 and uh, 100, um, the visual representation remains the same. And um, the effect size is almost 2.2. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with effect size, it's, it's simply a way of um, representing the magnitude of the difference between two groups or um, a way of representing the, um, the effectiveness of an intervention. And in education research, um, a large effect size is around 0.8. So something over 0.2 is quite large. Um, I had a, yes. Um, can you say a little bit more about your choice for the control condition? Like the uh, math task yes. seems like an odd choice. And then, like, are you measuring math skills? Does the math skills increase more for the control group? So we did not measure math skills. And that was actually one of the things that um, I wish could have been done differently. Um, one thing that I'll point out is that um, the study was designed before I joined the organization. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to do was actually, and, and you'll see this in uh, future directions, um, I would have loved to have uh, another English language learning program as a comparison. But 
Um, this was the first study that was done in an international context for age of learning. It was the first product um, developed for an, a, an international market. And we were actually testing for, um, this was a proof of concept in the sense that we weren't sure that a self-guided application could work and help children learn a new language. So that we kept it very, very simple deliberately. Can this product work in, um, in this case, China? Uh, so uh, that was the reason for us not selecting another, um, for example, a competitor product. Um, and we wanted to make sure that um, the participants had not had no exposure to English apart from this program. And yes, math app did not have any English to it. Um, and it is, I don't know that I would call it a true control condition, but um, that was the design that was first established. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so if you just called it math learning, English learning. Okay. I mean, at the very least, it's clear yeah. what's going on. Yeah. Um, there is another graph um, similar to this one. This represents the overview of the internal assessments. Um, and you will notice that across these sections, there's relatively little change between the pre and the post for the control. Not surprising. Uh, they didn't have ex any exposure to English. But between the pre and the post for the students who used uh, ABC Mouse English Learning Academy, there is a substantial growth that they experienced. Um, and the effect sizes across these uh, different sections range from 0.68 to 2.18. Uh, and you will note that the two sections that children had the most difficulty in is speech production and conversation. And one thing to point out here is that in language acquisition, productive skills like speaking and writing, they take longer to develop than receptive skills like listening and uh, reading. And the fact that we're talking about young children who are learning a second language in a context where English is not a day-to-day -day spoken language, the fact that they were able to, that we had uh, about a third of the sample um, produce some speech at the end of this study period was an exciting finding for us. Um, I can talk a little bit more about the details of these results later on, but for now I want to um, draw our attention to um, some of the feedback from the parents at the end of the study. Most parents indicated that they observed uh, significant improvements in the various language skills in their children from speaking, reading, understanding, and pronunciation. They also reported that uh, ABC Mouse English Learning Academy helped their children become more confident, interested, motivated in learning English, as well as being more self-directed as a learner and persistent as a learner. Um, I have a couple of quotes from the parents. Um, the thing that I want to kind of point out across all of these quotes is that um, students have developed a habit of using the program to learn English. It was a part of their daily routine, and it is something that they take the initiative to do. The next thing that I'm going to show is a short video. Um, you'll first see the student's performance after six to eight weeks of using the program, and then after 26 of using the program. Can we increase the volume? Can we increase the volume? Okay. Yeah. 
No? On my computer itself, right? going to turn our attention to Kat, who will share um, some of the work that we did with the in-game data that was collected during the course of the study. But before I do that, um, JC will give us a little bit of detail about um, the individual games. Sure. Uh, this is a game the cat is going to be uh, talk about the results. I'll give you some visual reference. You can know what they're about. Bubble Popper is like a vocabulary game. What type of vocabulary game is you hear a word and tap the thing? And the true or false, listen meaning, and the listen speak, they are uh, listening comprehension. You hear sentences or conversation, you choose the correct answer. And we also have speaking practice, which uh, you hear a word or sentences you repeat and after what you hear. And speech production is actually you hear a question and respond. Um, by your own. So Kat gonna see the results so you know what they're talking about. Thank you. All right, so I got into this project and there were obviously a lot of different pieces to it. There was an outside assessment, there was a huge amount of work that had been done with the curriculum, and there was all of this data that had been building up from learners playing the actual game. And our question was, what can we do with that data? Um, and it seems at first like it might be a really easy question. So there are you know, questions that you ask the students or the learners and they can get them right or they can get it wrong. Um, and so maybe all you care about is just that they get a lot of these questions right. Um, I'm gonna argue that's not really what you care about in learning. Well, one thing I thought about first was that you have to distinguish the, the first attempt kind of questions from questions where they're repeating attempts. So that was a big thing to sort out, and I recommend if you're ever dealing with a big games data set to think about things like that. What is a unique novel question? So this is a graph that's just looking for each one of these games at the average scoring that students are having for a first attempt in that game. And you can immediately see a very simple 
simple point, which is that some games are a lot easier than others. So for some of these games, the students are almost ceiling out, right? They're hitting like almost every time they'll get the first um, question right by the end of the study. And the speech production, the speaking practice, those skills that we already said were harder, those are much lower. So, you know, one thing you might say as well, a lot of the learning gain is happening in these really easy skills, and maybe they're not really doing so well in these other ones. Um, but something I also want to point out is that the movement in the scores, and this is just a good, a good exercise, I thought, in thinking about how do we look at scores, um, they're all really correlated. So um, if you look at the change in how much people move from uh, even, uh, even in games that they're scoring quite low on, um, they're, they're, that change is still correlated. So that's what the correlation is here is actually uh, instead of the average score at the end of the game, it, it's the correlation between how much they changed between games. And there is a little bit still of fuzziness here, right? So some of these harder games, um, they don't quite per perfectly correlate. But I think it's just an example of how you can pull these things apart. Some other stuff that I wanted to explore and look at are questions like, are learners playing the games at really different times of day? Um, these are sort of usage patterns. This is just an example I'm throwing up because really the answer is no. All of our learners are playing the games after dinner or around dinner time. So, you know, the school day is over. Your parents say it's, it's ABC Mouse, you know, English language time. Um, that was great. We looked at whether there were mistakes in the time of day. So, you know, maybe there's a kid getting up at nine and just kind of messing around on the app. There weren't real differences there either, um, but it was a neat thing to explore for. So that's another way you can think of it. But really, obviously, we were interested in this performance question. And so what this is is a density graph, and it shows you just all of these first attempt scores. So when learners are confronted with um, a novel question, how much are they getting it right and how much are they getting it wrong? And you can see the difference, right, in the beginning of the study. So in December, and this is all the way through June, um, they're, they're starting with a higher probability of, of making a wrong answer on a first attempt. And that changes. So that was a great little finding. You know, that connects. We already measured that they are learning English in these outside assessments, it was neat to see that the game performance ties up with that as well. But something I want to point out, which I think is especially nice for students in the room, is that wrong attempts don't go away. And in fact, we don't expect them to. And um, one of the reasons for this is that you're moving forward in a curricula. So challenge is continuing. And of course, all my learning people are nodding in the room. This is quite obvious to us. I cannot tell you how many folks I have worked with to whom this is not obvious. And the definition of the data comes to me like, you know, we want people to be successful, so we want them to always be getting everything right. And if we can just count up like the number of right things and that weighs, outweighs the number of wrong things, we'll have a statistically significant difference there and they'll have learned. That is not what challenge looks like. Challenge looks like you're still making a lot of wrong first attempts, especially in something where you're exploring. Um, so you can see you can see these interesting rises and falls in, in getting things right and getting things wrong. And a lot of our graphs, in the, this is one of the individual games, the, one of the games that was a little easier for kids. You can see that they start out getting more things wrong and then they have a real peak in like like just being excellent, and then you know the reality comes crashing back, and and you're like heart in harder territory, and things are starting to match up again. So you know we're interested in exploring this with much greater user data with, over longer periods of time. But I think these are the kind of patterns that you want to pull apart and think about when you're looking at everyday longitudinal data inside of a game. And I think you can see some of these rises and falls. Um, I like this one, the speaking practice game, which was hard because you can see kids um, be terrible at it at first and then get really good at it and then it gets very challenging and then they just sort of stop playing as much. They play this game only like half as much or less um, than the other games. So there's a lot of challenge calibration um, that we can take back to the design of the curriculum here. Just in the interest of time, I'll kind of whiz through here to our really interesting question. I also wanted to ask, given this data inside of the game, can we actually predict the language gain that we measured in the outside assessments? So let me talk a little bit about how I approach this question. 
One thing is that these were kind of the, the major variables that I knew we were really interested in trying to see if they would predict um, this English language proficiency gain. We had this kind of question I just talked about, the scoring, right, on every time you're confronted with a novel question in the game, do you tend to get it right or tend to get it wrong? So your, your real in-game performance. Um, we also had a measure of how much they repeat the different games. So you could kind of say this is, um, or the different questions in the games, you could go back and repeat them. Some kids have really high repeat counts, uh, which we weren't including in that first attempt score, right? But it was interesting that they were doing that. So kind of a measure of practice. We had a measure of how much they were initiating outside English use um, from the parents. We had age and gender, some different demographics there. And we also had this engagement measure that I was really interested in. So this was a self-report or, or a parental report, so an observed report by the parents. Um, and we got it every week. Um, and so I was looking at mostly at some averages but we got it over this long period of time. And something I want to point out too, you know, because we did spend a little bit of time in hypothesis testing land, is that this is much more exploratory than that. And that's frequently my approach with these kinds of things. We know that this stuff hangs together and it should hang together, right? Engage students, you know, will do better. They're getting this kind of cyclical effect. We're often looking in learning environments at very multi-collineated data. So I was much more interested in asking the question, especially in forming real product design, you know, if we could only pick one one of these measures, like what's the best way to divide this group up and say, um, similar in a healthcare setting where you might want to say, we know all these variables predict how, much, how likely you are to get the flu, but like what's the top one if we could only know one? So I looked at this with a recursive partitioning or a CART model it's sometimes called. Um, this is a ba basically a decision tree. So what it does is it takes all of these variables, takes the group of students and says, how should we best, what's the one that wins out at dividing this group? So going over to the left, these are the learners that end up in the cat, in it, that we predict that they'll have less of the English language gain. And on the right hand side, we'll predict that they'd have more gain. And the thing that won out over everything was this engagement score. Um, even over, over the first attempt scores, you know, and all these other usage metrics. It was really interesting to me. If you had an engagement score of 2.3 on average or above, um, we predicted that you had more ELP gain. The next one was age. Um, that was not a surprise because there is a big difference between, you know, five-year-old's capacity and six-year-old's capacity, and I expected that to show up pretty high in here. Um, but another one was also the practice measure, but not in the way I expected. Um, this this is a simplified, you know, tree. I have some more details later if you, anybody wants to get into it. Um, but uh, what was really interesting here was that I expected more practice to tie to a bigger ELP gain. But if you see the on the right hand side, right, the people who are actually repeating questions less than 15 times, we're seeing more ELP gain. And I went and looked at a lot of this data and I think that what this is capturing is that some learners are just like really compulsively repeating questions. Maybe the parents are not surprised by this. Uh, if you've ever had your kid like play a YouTube video 110 times, that's not the same thing as deliberate active learning practice. So that was a good, you know, of course, like duh moment for me, um, but it was really neat to see that. And I also think that it showed too that if you get trapped in this kind of repeating the question, you're probably also not moving forward in the curriculum at the same rate. So you're, you know, everything that you do replaces something else that you could do. So that was a cool thing to think about here. Oh. Yeah. Is engagement roughly how long I spend using a thing? Mm. Or like how stoked I am while I'm Yeah, it's how stoked you are. Is that that's right, yeah. Yeah. So we had actually other measures. We had duration. We had duration within the questions. We had a lot of um, that usage. And we were asking the parents about, you know, your kids like active and excited and, and it was like affect engagement. Yeah. Yeah. Really? So yeah, you'd think, I mean, duration is kind of like a proxy measure for just being in the game itself, but this was on top of the actual duration, like your feelings about it. Yeah, it was neat. Also, how yeah. It was the parent survey, yeah. So the the parents every week of the study, where we had 100% compliance, um, you know, bless them. Like, <laughs> where and this was a lot of surveys they felt because I looked at these survey data as well. Like, this is not just two questions about your kid, yeah, yeah. And they're they're rating it. Um, 
Let's see, how are we on time? Yeah. Yeah, so um, another thing that I found really interesting, um, Heejin mentioned that the parents, some of the parents didn't want kids to use the tickets. Um, I looked at ticket, so I, that just piqued my curiosity. You know, this is really exploratory, kind of suggestive. So I looked at um, the average number of tickets that you hold as a learner in the game, and it goes up and down and up and down because you're spending them and gaining them. Um, and there's a wide variation in how many tickets the learners hold. Um, but we actually found a small connection between, uh, in a couple mixed models that I ran, um, between the ELP gain and the number of tickets. I think this is suggestive, you know, it's a small number of learners, but it really made me think about the things that we think are a waste of time and the things that kids think are a waste of time. <laughs> Those aren't always the same, and I love to listen to the kids on that. So we have it in mind to think about designing, right, a much more controlled uh, look at this, this kind of thing. And everybody talks all the time about gamifying and giving tickets and incentivizing and all this stuff, you know, but, but also, knowing where those levers are placed in the game was pretty interesting to me. Um, and especially when you start to think about giving kids breaks from learning content, you know, they're aggressively rehearsing something and then they go to their room and decorate their fish. Like, it actually might be kind of a rest cycle built into the game. So I'd love to explore things like that. Yeah. So I want to just get through to kind of my, you know, mission statement. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and take charge here and do that. You know, we covered a bunch of stuff here, I know. I knew that um, I was gonna throw a lot at you, um, but that's the nature of this kind of work. So we covered the design and the translation of curricula. We showed you hopefully some evidence of learning gains. Uh, we looked at how I think about translating game scores. And we wanna cover a number of things in the future. So, you know, we want to hit these questions about the individualized difficulty. We want to talk about the impact of non-curricular activity, and I think Heejin has more to say about that. But I do want to say that I have some takeaways about, you know, when we evaluate a digital learning environment, a lot of times there's an impulse to just treat it as a straight translation. It's almost never, or really I think never, a straight translation. And maybe the design lab knows this, you know, but it's really hard to keep it in mind. I think that there's a unique power in remembering these are pretty new kind of environments. So you can allow for exploration. You can ask questions about non-directed learning. But we know that there's a really unique danger to some of these things, too. Um, I think about the work of people like Justin Reich, who find that in low SES classrooms, um, if you put in a whole digital content, they tend to actually lessen the quality of the curricula. So so it's not just taking the same curricula, they dump worse content into those kinds of things. So sometimes these initiatives to like supercharge and digitize classrooms will give um, low SES classrooms worse content and high SES classrooms better content. Um, so that translation is real work. I think another unique data is, uh, or danger is um, you can really misunderstand behavior. And you can really not think you're misunderstanding behavior. So that's something that I push you know, with my consulting all the time, is that when you have a large data system, you think explanations are obvious. And they are not obvious. The most obvious interpretation, like thinking the more right answers you get, you know, the more you've learned, is not always the right answer. And that this ecosystem usually changes the meaning of the data you have. So almost every time a project comes to me and, and we have pieces that are like the corollary data, and the you know, random weird other data, um, they become key to interpreting any of it. Thank you. Okay. Um, we showed um, here today some really high level results from the efficacy study. And we are uh, sharing that result and also some of the qualitative feedback that we got from the parents. Uh, with the product development team and the curriculum development team because we use the efficacy research evidence as something that continually informs our work um, as curriculum designers and product developers. And this year, we're adapting the game for Japan. And the goal is to conduct a similar efficacy study in Japan later this year, similar to the one that you saw um, today. And we're also refining the product for China to be used in schools. And when it is ready, uh, my goal is to conduct another randomized control trial 
this time having two control conditions where the first one is uh, using another digital English language learning program and uh, the, third, the second control condition would be business as usual in-person instruction. And uh, while ABC Mouse English Learning Academy is specifically designed for children learning English, we are supporting the use of our original ABC Mouse program um, in places like Spain, Costa Rica, and Papua New Guinea to help children there learn English as well as digital literacy skills. And that actually brings me to um, our mission statement once again, uh, which is to help children everywhere build a strong foundation for future academic success. And I just want to spend a, a couple seconds um, highlighting our education access initiative called Bring Learning to All. And um, our success as a for-profit organization enables us to provide um, nonprofit access to our programs. And last week, um, our uh, chairman of the board, um, Doug Doring, who is also the founder of the organization Age of Learning, announced at the World Education Forum in London in the presence of uh, representatives from ministries of education over 100 different countries, um, across 100 different countries, that uh, we are committed to partnering with governments and NGOs to provide our program free of charge to millions of children across the world. So if you are interested, um, and you know of other people who may be interested, I would invite you to visit our website, AOFL, Age of Learning, foundation.org. And we're always looking for research partners uh, to collaborate on the things that we have shared here today, um, similar to that, uh, to present academic papers and conferences. So please do feel free to uh, get in touch with any one of us.